the sort of typical way that we think of evolution happening is when we inherit traits from our ancestors. So shared ancestors result in shared traits. And this is called homology, which is discussed in a different video. But another way that we can understand change over time is convergent evolution. So convergent evolution is when you have a shared trait that occurred in two different mechanisms or two different pathways, even though there is not a shared ancestor. So we have different ancestors But the reason why those different ancestors got a shared trait is because they had similar selective pressures. So from two different ancestors, natural selection, so the same or similar selective pressure, caused the different organisms to have similar or, or, or a shared trait. So a more formal definition is De definition is that there's two different species with different lineages, so that's referring to those different ancestors. Um, they show similar characteristics, so again, that's shared types of traits because they have similar environments, and the similar environment is the similar selective pressure, and that results in convergent evolution. The shared trait, the similar traits, are considered analogous structures. So they're analogous, not homologous. So again, homology is something we'll talk about in a different video, but we're going to compare analogous structures to homologous. Homologous is when it's from their shared ancestor. So there's lots of examples of this in nature. Um, so for example, we can consider the giant anteater and the echidna. The giant anteater is from Africa and the echidna is from South America. Because they have, um, they're on different continents, we know that they're from different lineages. Okay, they don't have a close recent ancestor. Now they're both mammals, so they way back in time had a shared ancestor, but not a recent one. So they're considered different lineages on those different continents. And yet when we look at these different organisms, they have some similar traits. These are their analogous structures. So they both have long snouts. So there's a long snout, there's a long snout, um, and long tongues inside of that specialized for eating ants, okay? So they're different lineages. Their ancestor did not have these long snouts, but they both evolved the long snouts, it's a shared trait, because of a similar selective pressure. That selective pressure was to feed on ants, okay? Um, other examples, we have ivy and winter creeper, um, and they have aerial rootlets. That means, aerial means living in air instead of soil, and so they have roots that can live in air instead of soil, and that's because the selective pressure was to grow um, on other structures, so ivy growing up these different um, tree trunks, right? So the selective pressure was to grow in this different place of the tree trunks. Again, these are different lineages. They're not closely related plants. They evolved these traits separately. And an, a less visible example are these two fish here. Again, they're from very different lineages of fish, but they um, both live in cold, deep water, so that's the selective pressure. And so in order to survive in that cold, deep water, they have to have special antifreeze proteins in their blood. So the antifreeze proteins help keep their blood from freezing in these very cold environments. And again, they got this similar trait because of the selective pressure of living in cold water, even though they have different um, ancestors that did not have the trait. 
Another way that we can see change over time um, in living things is by a human manipulated situation. This is called selective breeding or also artificial selection. So this is where um, humans have modified the traits of living things in domesticated organisms. So this is like cows, horses, all of our crop plants, um, dogs, right? So all these different animals and plants that we have taken advantage of to help us with our food or just to be pets or whatever. Um, and so in order to get the desirable traits, um, we have chosen which of the organisms to breed. And so by doing that, we act as like the selective pressure um, and select for certain traits within that organism. So it's very similar to natural selection, only in natural selection, nature chooses the parents, right? Based on, again, like we've talked about, survival of the fittest. But in artificial selection, humans choose who mates. And this is based on whatever trait the human might be looking for, right? So if it's dogs, it's maybe a smaller dog or a specific color of dog, for example. So if this, in, to take a closer look at the dog example, we have the greyhound and the, oh, I always forget, Dokken. I always forget how you say this. I don't remember. The weenie dog is their non-formal name. Um, so this is a very large dog with very long legs. And this is a very small dog with extremely short legs. All dogs trace their ancestry to the wolf. So this is the, the wild animal. And from the wild wolf ancestor, humans have selected all of the different dog breeds. So at two ends of the spectrum, we have the very large dogs and we have small dogs, okay? And the way we did that was say we wanted a small dog. Well, when we first started interacting with wolves, we said, oh, this puppy is a small puppy. Oh, and this other puppy is a small puppy. Let me take the two small puppies and have them have babies together. And then the next time you had puppies, you said, okay, let me take two small puppies and let them have babies together. And then a next generation took those puppies and put the small puppies and let them have puppies together. And so they kept doing this with every litter of puppies. And over time, they got to a point where all of the puppies were small. And this happened with a whole range of traits in dogs that led to all of the different dog breeds today. Now, of course, as you may know, the side effect of always doing that is that your, um, your dog breeds end up um, very inbred so that you end up with a concentration of other traits as well. So most purebred dogs, um, when they have those specific desirable traits that the breeder was selecting for, um, they may also end up concentrating less desirable traits. So most purebred dogs have some kind of diseases that may have accidentally been concentrated by the breeder. So for example, in um, Labrador retrievers, hip dysplasia is a common issue. In collies, you have blindness as an issue. So you end up concentrating other traits as well. So we've done this with all kinds of animals. Again, any animal that we eat for food, we've done this with, as well as our um, pets. Um, plants, same thing. We did this with corn, with wheat, with rice. And the example here is the brassica family. So the brassicas are um, also the, um, the cabbage family plants um, is another a name for them. So cabbage, cauliflower, Brussels sprouts, broccoli, kale, kohlrabi, mustard greens, all of these um, are related to the wild mustard plant. So just like with the wild wolf, we took the wild mustard plant and we started breeding it for all these different traits that we liked. So sometimes we wanted to emphasize um, this the, the uh, specific leaf structure. Sometimes we were going for bigger flower parts. Um, and so by choosing which plant mated with which plant, we optimize specific traits. 
Um, another illustration of this is within corn. Um, and you can see this is generations of corn. So by 75 generations, um, they had selected for radically different types of corn. So there's lots of different types of corn. Um, so you may be familiar with like corn on the cob. Corn on the cob is oftentimes selected for sweetness. So particularly modern varieties have been modified to have more sugar. Um, and then we have feed corn. Um, and feed corn is oftentimes um, chosen for high starch or high oil content because um, you're feeding it to animals. So you want that to make the animals bigger. And then um, you may be familiar with the product corn oil, right? And so if you wanted a corn oil, uh, a corn that you're going to make corn oil out of it, you would want to select for high oil content. And so plant breeders worked on making a, a variety of corn that was much higher in oil content. And that's this type here. So again, by selecting for taking corn and saying, okay, this corn has high oil. Let me breed it with another corn that has high oil content. Did that over many, many, many generations. And you end up with a population of corn plants that are very high in oil content and do the same thing with low oil content. And you can end up with a strain of corn that has very low oil content. And so again, this illustrates the this change over time in organisms. In this case, change manipulated by the activities of humans for our own benefit.